Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's FS Club webinar. I'm uh, dialing in here from London, and I'm delighted to have Phil Roof, the CEO of, of P2 FinCrime, here with me today. And Phil's subject is what uh, keeps professional financial crime professionals awake at night. And when you think about it, that is a heck of a subject, especially today as we're seeing a, a burgeoning of crime. Uh, all across the web, uh, and some of it due to the pandemic. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, and it really is my privilege to be able to host so many of these webinars, which range widely across technology, economics, and finance. And today, of course, all three meet technology, the economics of crime, and finance. So it's a, a, it's a big program. Our sponsors are particularly tolerant, and I might point out that Phil and the team at P2 FinCrime our silver sponsors as well, and we're delighted to, when we get the opportunity to host a sponsor to boot. So that, that's a, an excellent opportunity for us today. And I would just say that the normal uh, regime applies. And my job is to get out of the way and let you hear from our expert, Phil, backed up by his team. Phil's going to be speaking for about 20 minutes, and then we have sufficient time, hopefully, for Q&A. We have quite a few people registered today, uh, well over 140. So uh, please do get your questions, comments, and observations in early, and I'll feed them into a discussion with Phil starting at about 25 past four. Um, a few obvious questions. Uh, one, yes, there are slides, and they are already posted. You can see that in the chat room, and they will be up there on the website where you're registered. Uh, secondly, the recording will be going up in about 48 hours, and it will be available to you and any colleagues or whomever you, you wish to share it with. Uh, and finally, uh, to ask your questions and comments, please use the GoToWebinar facility. I'm online here with you, and whilst I may see your Signal, WhatsApp, uh, WeChat, or email messages, uh, it will be too late. So please do use the Q&A facility here. All of those questions uh, and it, uh, will be sent to Phil uh, with your email attached to it. So if you've got a specific or detailed question you'd like him to answer, but don't want to take it here online, uh, just send it in the chat facility and it will get to him uh, later today. So with no more ado, if I might, uh, Phil, the floor is very much yours. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I would, uh, I'm would. i from the south of London at the moment, so I'm going to apologise in advance. If we do get an Amazon delivery, you will hear my dog racing out to meet them. Uh, so watch out for that. I also um, apologise for any dodgy Wi-Fi and what we can. Uh, all my family are off of Xboxes, so hopefully it'll hang out. Um, as you know, FS Club are a bit different uh, than many other webinars. I'm not going to bore you with my life story when I took my first steps, the swimming badges I won, and my meteoric rise through various different companies ending up here. Um, if you want to know more about me, then please check out my LinkedIn profile and, and do get in touch. Uh, the five second summary is I've got 30 years in financial services, uh, the last 11 in financial crime, and worked on the front line of a number of banks around the globe. Um, now help them out uh, when they're on the regulatory scrutiny. So whilst I knew what was keeping me awake at night, I did call a few of my friends who are still working in large global institutions uh, to check uh, their concerns and issues. And the next few slides uh, summarise those. And rather than just putting up a big list of issues, I put them into a few different groups. Um, unusually, I'm going to start with a few personal concerns uh, because I actually think that you probably share them with me. So I've got those up front. And then we'll talk about a few corporates and issues, some scams, some stuff on the horizon. Um, and some no regrets actions that I think would be uh, a good idea to get on with. And hopefully somewhere in there, uh, there'll be some helpful thoughts for you to take away. So Michael, uh, in, in the true Chris Whitty style, next slide please, thank you very much. Um, so some personal concerns, I have three sons. Um, one of them is at uni at the moment, um, and he mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs to me recently, which took me right back to my own studies. Um, Maslow puts personal security in the second block after food, water, shelter, etc. Um, I do know that chatting from other people with other people, um, there are some real concerns about protecting those around us. Some things that we take for granted as financial crime professionals, uh, such as spotting phishing emails or hanging up on a scam call, blocking a fake text, aren't as clear to those who don't live and breathe this stuff every day. So how do we share information and knowledge without scaring those around us? I pass on fraud updates to my parents, aunts, uncles, uh, when I get them and they look sensible and easy to follow. Um, social media links and emails are often the best way. As a result of this, my mother has taken the scam threat seriously and she has a whistle by the phone that she blows really loudly 
when she gets a scam call before hanging up. Uh, I can't only imagine what that's like on the other end, particularly when it's not a scam call, but that works for her. Uh, my main worry is that my sons get caught in one of these scams. Um, they're active on social media, as I'm sure many of our uh, children are, um, and they use platforms that I don't really use, like TikTok and Snapchat, so I don't get to see the scams coming through. I see stuff on Facebook and Instagram, and I do share them, hoping that the triggers are the same. I know the scams are out there. Uh, one of my sons recently asked me about GameStop and the fact that some of his mates were buying shares because they'd seen something on social media about something, some people making thousands. And should he follow suit and invest? I explained to him by the time it had filtered down to him, the real money had probably already been made and the late covered comers would probably be cleaned out. Uh, wait to see if he took my advice or not as to uh, whether he's got any money left at the end of term. It's the speed of design uh, and release that demonstrate how agile the criminals are. The fake vaccine scams came out about the same time as the real ones went live on the NHS websites, playing on people's fear and also their trust in the NHS name. I am really pleased to see the government is now running ads on social media and in the press, for example, flagging that vaccines are always free. It's uh, good to see them catching up um, and putting those information out there. Other uh, piece on this slide, we talk about fake job ads and fake property ads. Again, playing on people's uh, fears and those that are vulnerable, seeking employment or places to live, hooking them into paying excess fees and then dumping them. Once you know, that hundreds, if not thousands of pounds are at stake, which is why this stuff is so attractive to the criminals and why that, you know, they can really divert their resources to try and uh, go after us in these spaces. Uh, we're able to have a couple of polls um, during the webinar, and I think we'll go on to one now. On the next slide, please, Michael. That's so, great. So a simple poll, really. Just wondered um, if any of you had uh, received a scam attempt. So if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Great. We've launched that poll. It's interesting you point uh, out, particularly that last one on fake property ads, Phil. Interestingly, in our family, just the other week, my daughter stumbled across one she detected it but uh, the fact that people put these up means that they uh, they expect that they'll work with uh, at least a significant minority to make money anyway um as ever with the fs club 80 percent of the audience have voted i'm just about to close the poll giving a second or two for folks to come in and i'm afraid uh, we we live in a very scam rich environment uh, as you can see here 72 percent have had all three uh, and i think both you and i can vote huh? so uh, <laughs> But at least if you could just hand out your mother's numbers so we don't call her, that'd be useful. <laughs> yeah, I will. Interesting, 1% hadn't. I think there's a very lucky 1% from this call. Um, and unfortunately, uh, those results do play true. Um, that it's a very prevalent thing out there. And as you said, Michael, it's a numbers game. Um, so the reason uh, these things are successful is they just pump out so many. Uh, you only have to have a very small hit rate to actually uh, make money in this space. Um, the slide we've got uh, up and running now is um, really talking about uh, money muling uh, and spoofing. Uh, there's some data there um, from uh, Action Fraud, which uh, runs up to the September 2020 uh, and showed an enormous increase in activity over that time. I'm expecting it even go to, to even higher when they get the 2021 numbers. Um, there's a, a graphic on the right hand side which talk about how money muling works. Again, just a very simple uh, set of statements. You can see why they go after it with the amount of um, funds that are available. Um, and another type of uh, fraud is cuckoo smurfing where criminals place money into accounts and unwittingly involve that individual in laundering criminal funds. Um, at the bottom, the little panel, Emma 5, um, this was a, um, a money muling activity that took place in 2019. So this is um, a, a large scale um, financial crime uh, set of actions that were taken place by the regulatory authorities. Um, it's great to see so much success. So 31 com countries were involved, 650 banks uh, and 17 banking associations involved, leading to 228 arrests, um, catching 386 herders. So those are the people that are driving the mules and actually identifying 3,833 mules and 4,700 victims. Uh, just in this act action alone, 12.9 million of losses were prevented. And whilst those are the hard stats, you can only guess how many lives were saved, either actually or theoretically, in terms of those people being 
uh, found and helped on the money mule side. So a huge um, exercise uh, European wide um, and a great outcome, but just one, um, one of many. So these little graphics are the sorts of things I share um, with my family, just because it's simple, easy to understand and sort of demystifies it. Michael, next slide, please. We asked the question, um, really, what do, what would I do? Um, sorry, I was just on that one there. Um, I do share headlines, um, I do encourage cascades, um, and I do share the pictures when I get them. Um, so looking at the corporate challenges, this is a pretty much a back to basic slide um, that I'm sure could have been written back in 2009, but unfortunately is still relevant now because uh, institutions are still falling into the same traps. Um, it's all the basics around, do you understand the risks? Have you identified them? Have you, your company set an appetite? Do you know what is, you are within an outside appetite? Um, and do you have investment where you, uh, where you have problems that, that are currently outside? But do stakeholders within the organizations understand that they have a, a role to play in managing financial crime risk? The stats in the middle from the report show that despite it being 2020, um, this problem is not going away. So last year, 28 financial institutions were fined for money laundering uh, violations. The total fines were $3.2 billion. Uh, Q3 was the highest activity, um, and no surprise that the US remained the most active, uh, levying around half of the fines. Um, interestingly, interesting to see that the um, Australians, who were previously held up as a, a shining beacon of compliance a few years ago, are now having to put their house in order. Uh, with fines and improvement programs in all main um, Australian financial institutions. You can tell when the tide is turning as the phone starts to ring um, and myself and a few of my colleagues started getting phone calls from Australian headhunters uh, two or three years ago, which is obviously the precursor uh, to the regulatory action. I'm a little bit closer to home in the UK. Um, the FCA settled with Commerce Bank last year uh, with a fairly hefty fine. And only just recently, uh, bottom right, you can see that NatWest are back in the spotlight again, um, having had some challenges in the past. It's going to be very interesting to see how this one plays out, uh, particularly as uh, NatWest are on a fairly uh, hefty UK operations downsize and leveraging technology uh, and offshore resources in this space. Um, so it's a, a particularly uh, interesting one that's going to run for a while, I would imagine. Next slide, please, Michael. Thank you. Uh, we mentioned scams before, but it isn't just the NHS, job, job ads and property ads are subject to scams. The criminals have realized there are significant sums to, in targeting the investment space. With interest rates really low, investors are seeking the best returns. This often means switching investments between companies to get the best deals. This ironically means that the savvy investors who are seeking good returns are becoming the victims versus the passive investors who just let their ices their investment savings account just languish on negligible returns. Often the ISA pots can run into tens of thousands of pounds. Um, the criminal only has to offer a few decimal points better return to catch the eye of the investor because the interest rates are so low. So we not only now have to look for fake websites, but also fake comparison sites, which are now in operation. And I would really challenge you to spot the difference. It is very, very tricky. The basic web page looks, web page looks totally legitimate. The click-throughs into forms are, look real and they're often copied direct from source. The callback sounds fine and then the investor is caught and the money is gone. Unfortunately, in even more extreme cases, there are massive gains to be targeted from pension pots, which can run into hundreds of thousands of pounds after a lifetime of diligent saving. Again, fake comparison sites, good but not outrageous returns, which look really legitimate and may have links to uh, legitimate sites. Um, but once the investor has clicked through, the criminal machine will play every single trick in the book to try and try and get the money. They'll claim that deals are closing soon, changes in tax are coming, which will take away this benefit in return. The fund is nearly full, so you must act now. Put down a small sum to secure your space, and the pressure just piles on until the investor clicks, and then the disappear disappearing act happens, and the funds bounce around the globe through shell companies and offshore uh, areas, unfortunately never to be seen again. And because the investor was complicit in re the release and transfer, it becomes very difficult um, for them to get their funds back 
and there's uh, lots of ongoing activities in the UK to try and help them. But what is the bank's role in this in this sort of space? What can banks and financial institutions do? Um, we, they have sophisticated detection tools. They can try and stop people moving money out without authorization. They can put hurdles in place to support the customers. But really, the banks can't get in the way. This is the customer's money and they can do what they want. Uh, but unfortunately, they're left picking up the pieces um, at the end. I'm really pleased to see that um, there's progress being made, particularly with Google Ads, uh, which have been uh, used in, in some of these fake sites previously. Um, there's a link on the page where you can see the, uh, the letter that was recently sent to the FCA by Google saying, we understand this is a problem and this is what we're doing about it. And our friends at Aviva um, have done quite a lot of activity um, in this space. Have a quick look on the, the next slide. So Aviva have invested significant amounts of money um, in trying to support their customers and anyone who wants to click on the Aviva site really to, to spot fake investments, which is clearly now I now understand is a serious issue. Um, they've got dedicated pages with all sorts of issues. You can see on the panel on the left what to do if you uh, to avoid getting scammed, how to spot problems, um, and what, what to do, where to look for real legitimate information. Um, on the right hand side are the latest lists of fake websites linked to Aviva, which they've been working to take down. I'm pleased to see they have taken down most, but just an incredibly long list of sites that um, the investors could have clicked on and then be in a spiral of challenge. And this is just Aviva. They are clearly quite proactive in this space. Um, but interestingly, I'm not sure what other companies are doing, investment companies and ISA providers, and how, how um, up, to, up to speed and communicative they are on this issue. And this leads us into our next poll, please, Michael. Indeed, and just to here to launch that poll. Thanks. Great. So has your bank or investment manager made you aware of potential spoof or fake websites that you might fall victim to? Yet again, uh, the speed of our audience always amazes me, Phil. <laughs> Over half have voted and we didn't even make it to 10 seconds. No problem. Um, so well over three quarters have voted. I'll give it just a few more seconds before I close the poll. Now just closing the poll. And I'll present the results with nearly 90% of the audience. Um, basically 61% uh, say no. Yeah. And that's really quite frightening, isn't it? Because this is a quite a financially aware audience and yet they don't feel they've been contacted by their bank or investment company with this problem. And just looking at Aviva, it clearly is a problem. It's highly unlikely that Aviva are the only ones who have been targeted. So please uh, just sort of beware <laughs> and take extra care when you are, you are navigating around this sort of stuff. And what's on the horizon? So looking a little bit further forward, um, if you're involved in financial crime, what are the current issues you should be looking out for? Um, we, we touched briefly on uh, human trafficking and modern slavery and whilst they have been perennial issues we're now looking at how financial services can use the tools um, to help root out the criminals and spot the money and track the money that's behind them. Um, financial institutions do see the flow of the money and do have some very powerful tools now that can be deployed in this place um, to actually see the, the global movement. Similarly uh, with regards to the movement of fake or restricted or endangered goods, there is always a money trail that can be followed. Uh, and if enough organizations collaborate, you can actually reach all around the world and spot and hit the smugglers uh, where the only place it's going to hurt them, which is in the pocket, stopping their ability to trade. Interestingly, um, the cloud has been seen as a really good source of improved resilience and cost saving in organizations um, as they move away from their sort of in-house server farms. Um, but we're hearing that there's a bit of a pushback now from some countries and companies who are concerned about their data being held on US with US companies and potentially US servers. Um, it's whilst it is a theoretical theoretical concern, because I'm sure those companies will tell you that they have never released the data. We are hearing that some are seeking decentralized stores of data now. So an interesting challenge that uh, the cloud was seen as the answer to everything. And people are now um, pushing back a little bit uh, against it. Similarly, on the green issues, coming more to the fore uh, as, the, as the sort of movement gains gain speed, uh, lots of pressure on companies investing in um, fossil fuels, et cetera. 
So again, using the DFIs as a route to drive a change in behaviour. Um, on the geopolitical side, um, previously the, the approaches to sanctions were quite blunt um, and they're now becoming more refined, um, which is a, you know, an interesting challenge in itself. So a couple of things that are on the horizon and we'll look at one more in, in a moment in a bit more detail. Next slide, please, Michael. Um, so we talked a little bit about modern slavery previously and there is uh, quite a lot of activity in the UK at least on the supply chain side. Um, so you can see there's an extract from the Modern Slavery Act which came in in 2015. Um, last year the government pushed ahead and said that any public body, bodies with a you know, decent sized budget um, would have to, have to report on the steps they'd taken to prevent slavery, so good progress there. And then this year um, they were actually the government again reporting that they're going to start to levy fines uh, for organisations who are not transparent. So uh, trying to definitely do some things in this space, uh, which is which is interesting and hopefully positive and will be adopted elsewhere. And looking globally, um, the headline on the top right, um, Boohoo uh, under pressure from US regulators uh, who are looking at the supply chain um, and trying to drive out uh, issues in that space. Um, and then at the bottom, supply chains themselves becoming, as we would expect, becoming a target of hackers uh, because they are often long and complex and seen as a seen as a weak link. In all of these spaces, there's, there are roles for financial services. Um, once something, once funds are gained, there is always a money trail. The technology is coming on leaps and bounds, and our ability to monitor patterns and flows is improving uh, as we look at sort of big data solutions. Uh, any ability to restrict access to market, restrict, restrict access to funds, uh, causes those criminals criminals problems. Next slide, please, Michael. Final slide, actually, which is good. Um, we mentioned a little bit about um, what a actions you can take. So, in these sort of scary times with all the doom and gloom, um, what can you do? Well, you can definitely share some of this. You can talk to people. We can repost, share interesting articles because the more we know, the better. But there are definitely some data actions that can be undertaken. Um, a lot of this comes back to data, and the better data, the better data quality you have, the more ability you'll have to leverage systems and processes um, to drive out this kind of these kind of problems. You can get it all the data in one place rather than all over the place in distributed systems. You can work out what the key bits of that data are and over time fill in those gaps. Often there are error patterns because people fast keyed new customers or, or things were uploaded in blocks and so you may have dates set at 010101 etc which are easy to find and can then be fixed. As you move new data in, you can fix it via the extract, transfer and load systems to try and uh, identify problems and solve them. Um, make sure that all new customers stopping the bleed effectively. Um, anyone new coming in has all their data up to date with uh, the key attributes filled in. And then make the tools you've got work really hard uh, to try and spot problems and patterns. It's great to copy the big guys, but don't assume that because you've got a big box that everything is, is going to be fixed. Um, there are some really good, uh, agile, flexible partners out there who are happy to run proof of concepts for you, which you have to accept may fail, but ultimately may help you solve a particular problem that you've got um, in the data space. Uh, I think we're on to the final kind of thank you and well done slide. We are. We are indeed. Well, thank you very much. That's a very, very stimulating opening, Phil. And we've got quite a few questions here, folks. Again, uh, just type them into the go-to questionnaire uh, facility. Um, so uh, Michael Levy, uh, who's quite quite an expert on this, is uh, they send some. Uh, this is referring to your poll about um, financial services provider. They send some data when you log into remote banking, but not the generality of scams like the Aviva site. Only those that abuse them. Um, so how realistic is it to expect our financial services providers to be informing us about all scams? Yeah, I don't think it's realistic, but there are definitely themes out there. So they have privileged access to us, they have secure channels, um, and whilst, whilst the challenge probably for them is being selective enough with us and providing insights where it can help us ultimately to help them as well. Um, so we don't want five emails a day, but there may be a roundup you know, once a month on the themes that are coming through. So you're quite right, we wouldn't expect to be told about everything, but even just getting people thinking that way 
and getting the mindset of a, you know an air, a ledge of suspicion when you receive something not just blindly following a text or a, a prompt is just helping the general population to move a little bit more um, towards uh, understanding rather than expecting to solve and spot everything which which would never happen I mean I, this is me personally Phil I, I, I'm a little sort of torn on this because if everybody like Aviva did that then you'd have a plethora of you know a few hundred websites doing this all with contradictory stuff and different graphics and using different names for what are effectively the same scam and also operating to some degree as a training manual for financial criminals is there uh, is there not an opportunity for the industry to cooperate yeah i think it it, it there should be you're quite right there this shouldn't be a com an area of competitive advantage it should be cooperation um getting the companies together is is a challenge you know some of the all party parliamentary groups have managed to do that um, there's a number of apvgs running at the moment in key areas um, so yeah i think there's i think there's opportunity for collective as well as individual action um, just to try and grab catch the eye of the investor it may be that some gravitate towards the central advice and some will gravitate towards the local advice so i think more is probably better without uh, obviously recognizing the potential to overload. Well, Hugh Purser is interested in catching them young. Uh, uh, so yeah. exactly. Phil, do you know, is this subject being taught in any way in the classroom in schools today? I think that some of the organizations do sort of money matters basics. Um, and I've actually seen one of my sons who's doing his A-levels at the moment is studying this as part of one of his business degrees in terms of um, the various different places you can get funds and the risks that go with it. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's getting down right to the sort of early savings. Um, I think luckily there are some really good products out there that are teaching kids good financial disciplines. And it may be that you can tack this sort of thing onto it a little bit like stranger danger for the, you know, the, the kind of the wider, the wider, scarier stuff. Um, but you just think about they're so easy to exploit and often move in sort of herds. Um, and so that's the challenge with the, the uh, younger people, I think. But I've got young relatives who are kind of little um just getting into their teens and i'm already sharing via an aunt and an uncle um this sort of stuff to say when you think it's appropriate please share it with them rather than you know forcing it on myself but yeah i think the earlier the better just a bit of savvy in this space would be great uh, chris david makes a couple of points uh, one is a, is a salutary reminder never never mind the fake websites what about outright fraud uh, in the regulated financial space, so don't forget to RBS, GRG, and things like that. Um, yeah. But he does go on. Uh, you had a lot of comments about AML uh, in the fines, right? But what are the other challenges for the corporates beyond the AML? And are, are people being fined at all for not being complicit in this scam? But there's a scam going on. It's part of it. But what we got in was legit. What came out was legit. What's our problem? Yeah, I think AML is kind of a blanket term. It would be financial crime um, that's probably, you know, more more relevant. And the sanctions areas are the ones that, you know, as you know, uh, really drive the big fines. Um, I think general corporate governance and corporate behavior, you know, their the standards are expected to increase over time. Um, and organizations being held held to account for failure in this space, a little bit like um, the NatWest uh, point that, we, that was made earlier, um, can only drive that up. If you can get it to board level and you can get it uh, of interest to board, either via personal accountability, uh, the fines have made an impact, but whether it's enough of an impact, who can tell? Um, but yeah, very difficult to, to drive and police at that level. Um, corporate governance um, is, a, is an ongoing challenge uh, and doing the best for the shareholder versus the customer is a, a constant battle, I would think, in most organizations. Um, Ian Sheridan reminds us that uh, BlackBerry was is famous for its data security. Um, so there was a, a point at which we had the kind of the security of the BlackBerry um, versus um, the smartphones uh, with all of their multiple apps. Uh, what, what particular advice do you have for corporates with regard to smartphones and apps on them? I think it's a, yeah, you have to invest an enormous amount of time and care in that space because the ease of you everybody wants the user experience to be slick and simple but the trade-off is against security uh, we've worked with one organization really recently 
um, that put an enormous amount into the customer experience, but then balanced it with the security side as well. So I think you have to be running this stuff in parallel with two-factor authentication or you know, the secure encrypted channels in order to, to keep your data and your customer's data secure. Um, you, know, you only have to look at the damage that was done to TSB, who were at kind of peak, uh, peak Twitter troll kind of thing um, when they had the, the security breach there. Nobody, that's a very salient kind of learning point in terms of speed to market versus security. Um, at the time, we, we spoke to the guys afterwards who were over there, and they said that they had more than four times the number of customer complaints than they had customers. So people were just piggybacking on this wave of anger in order to get hits and retweets and actually not being customers at all. So they were just you know, completely buried by um, the sort of the Twitter storm that overtook it. So it's a really good good one to note that you know don't skimp on security because it will come back and bite you hard. Hmm. Uh, Richard Parler is a bit of a cynic, um, but he's, he, he points out you know that the SEC reports that only around 50% of the fines that it levies are actually paid. Um, do you do you have any knowledge of whether or not in the UK that's different? Have these fines actually been paid? Yeah, I think the, so. I mean, we, the US as well has a fairly hefty discount model. I think in the UK, you get 30% off if you pay within a certain amount of time. Um, but these things take a long time to negotiate and a long time to come to market. You know, by the time we hear about them or there's a press release, it's probably been running for two, three, four, maybe even five years. Um, and during that time, there will have been lots of actions and mitigations. So actually, when you look at the fines themselves, um, the company are allowed to explain what they've done in the interim period. But I think in the, in the UK, the FCA is, is fairly hot and offers a, a fairly hefty discount for paying. Um, and it's it's obviously a smaller market than the SEC has to police. Um, and so I would anticipate that they can they can probably get their arms around or, you know, they can probably drive compliance a bit quicker. Hmm. Uh, Martin White uh, is asking, you know, whom should we report scandals to? Um, he has a I text think- last week claiming to be from TSB asking yep. me to click through if I don't recognize the action they are reporting. You know, yep. where, where do we do this? So uh, the action fraud is a really good place. They've got uh, places you can forward text onto. In the, this is the UK. Um, if you're in a different area, then just uh, checking in with your regulator because they've all got websites that will receive forwarded emails and forwarded texts that they will add to their kind of bank of knowledge. Um, and it, it's definitely worth doing because it just helps them to, to see what the, the way the criminals are, de- are developing. Um, but yeah, there's always a, a short form forward that can be done uh, to build up the data, which is key. Do you have any, uh, everybody here is interested in enforcement. Do you have any data or statistics on enforcement at all? Um, well, I think the... Before I do yeah. that, I've got a little incoming here from Michael Levy. Uh, apparently there's a place you can go to report at phishing.gov.uk. And I'll spell phishing, which is P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. So report at phishing.gov.uk. Sorry, back to enforcement figures, because certainly uh, I've reported quite a few over the years, and it just seems to go into a dead box. Yeah, I think it's one of the things we're definitely wrestling with in the UK. It it would fall into a similar category to the suspicious activity reports. Um, And, you know, the number of SARS uh, is rising, which is good. Um, However, the central... uh, uh, evaluation and administration of those is very challenging. So there is a, actually there's an um, all party parliamentary group at the moment looking at SARS and trying to overhaul, overhaul the whole process so that organisations can submit data in a structured way that can be evaluated more easily than a free form template that's been used previously. So I do think there is uh, recognition that um, just using SARS as a pure example that, that needs to be improved and pleased to see that that's probably been running for about a year now um, and will hopefully come with a, a set of recommendations that institutions can adopt quickly and will allow the data that is submitted to be crunched through much faster. There are some stunning tools out there now, um, but if you can get it in, in a, a logical way, you can definitely get the results out quicker as well. Mm-hmm. It was interesting you had that rather extensive list of Spoof sites that Aviva knows. Um, I, I too have uh, tried to help some friends who've had uh, some really strange spoof sites that do seriously detract either from the reputation of their business or directly draw business away. 
Uh, and again, I found it very difficult. If somebody as big as Aviva can't get these shut down, what's yeah. the hope of the average Joe? Well, I think the good thing is they have. So, but on that list, um, if you try and move them, they have been shut down now. That they obviously keep them on there as a kind of rolling warning, if you like. Um, but very difficult when these sites are hosted um, outside, you know, core domains. And I think it is a case of looking at the website name, tracking back to the trusted home site, and making sure you can get to it from that. It's a little bit like hanging up when the bank phones you and tries to get you to do something. Hang up and ring from a different phone. Um, it's if you're making a significant uh, a significant decision, which involves you know financial investments, etc. Then you know you don't just go to Google and put in a, a term and follow it through and transfer the money. You know you need to go to what you know is a trusted site, which you can find from you know the FCA and from the the core host sites as well. Uh, one of our old timers from West London, Ian uh, Harris, is kind of curious. You know, uh, 25, 30 years ago, digital certificates were all the rage. So, uh, you know, where, where do they stand today? They were supposed to allow me to identify specifically that I was on a, you know, on one track with any any particular entity on the web. Yeah, I think he probably knows more about that than me, to be honest. Um, you know, you hope that the trusted sort of HTTPS and then the the, the legitimate site would get you there. I think that that's the if you look at if you hover over it's the classic isn't it when you get an email if you hover over the email address it'll give, it'll tell you what the true address is behind it um, looking at the the name on the web page and looking for those misspellings you know of either with two V's or something like that that try that just catches you um, the good thing is that companies are doing more and more um, pen testing and you know education of their people to try and look for this stuff um, but no I'm afraid I can't help with digital certificates it was probably a, a little bit earlier in my career that they were um, they were coming through. Uh, he's very old, Ian. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Lasse Instafjord Alsvag is curious. He, he's interested in uh, getting into a career of fighting f uh, financial crime uh, from sort of a typical plain payments career. Where would you recommend that one would apply in today's environment to make the biggest impact? Would it be the police? Would it be move into politics, move into a bank, media, FS providers, uh, consultancy? Wow. What would you recommend to make the most impact? What sector can really pull it off? Kind of a broad market, isn't it? I think you need to move through them. So I've seen people in law enforcement have had a you know a, a, a good career on the front line and then move into industry and bring that knowledge and network with them. Anywhere you can build a network that's cross cross industry, cross government, cross agency, I think you can add real value. Often we sit in a silo and know the people around us and it's a bit of an echo chamber. If you can operate across a number of different areas with a, a network uh, of sort of trusted colleagues, I guess that's where you would have the most impact. And that's probably where, you know, moving law enforcement into government, into industry, into consulting, those people who have moved across industries, I mean, um, on, on, on the page now is a picture with myself and Peter Hazelwood. Peter Hazelwood started out in uh, the police in Hong Kong, I think it was, and then moved into, into industry and you know back into consulting and out to industry again. So an example of a career that spanned several different um, verticals, if you like. So I think that's probably where you can make the most difference because you, you see the problem from different angles and you build up a, a network of people um, you know, who you can access really. Mm -hmm. Uh, very oddly, I, I spent uh, this morning on a uh, looking at some of the inserts, particularly onboarding systems and apps. Uh, what, what do you think is kind of the most exciting piece of new technology out there that might make a material difference uh, to, to fraud? Um, so I think the prevention of fraud. Um, I think it's the it's the click through services that are now offered with ID and V that you can do securely. Um, it's the balance between uh, ease and security, I think, is, is critical. Um, if you move up into the, the sort of macro level, um, some of the companies that are op operating uh, with big data solutions now, so instead of having a big box in the corner that the lights flash to look for very specific um, patterns and trends, these, these um, cloud-based units just look for flows and trying to spot different patterns in the flow that you would never think of looking for. Um, so Quantexa are doing some good, really interesting stuff at the moment, having some great success, um, which means that traditional transaction monitoring, which was a bit of an art rather than a science, 
um, is, is becoming much clearer. And instead of getting thousands of false positives, you can, you can look at for patterns that stand out and then interrogate the pattern uh, and, and find the anomaly. So I think at the macro level, we look at that sort of thing. At the micro level, it's the, it's the quality of the apps, and the interface interfaces, and your ability to link to the DVLA or to other um, trusted systems um, that mean that you can hopefully get through some of the pain of uh, ID and V, uh, another other aspect of onboarding, and then stay up to date as well. So it's all well and good getting a legitimate customer in. You need to be happy that that can, customer continues to be legitimate throughout their life cycle with you, rather than you know being handed off to somebody else who, who takes on that that um, persona. Um, one of Zian's interns is asking, why do companies' compliance, anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, and similar programs fail? Is it the programs themselves, internal cultures? You know, what are the issues arising that seem to mean these are so long? I, I mean, the SARS thing has been going on since I did a study on AML 17 years ago. We we still had this over-reporting backlog, you know, basically just wasting the information that's being expensively gathered. It doesn't yeah. seem to make much progress, is it? What what what, what would to what would you attribute that? I think it's the because it's a very large and complex issue, they tend to have very large and complex programs. And as we know, any large and complex program that runs for multiple years will often fail in certain areas because the business itself or the technology is moving on and they try and catch up. Um, so I, I do think that if you can be targeted about the problem and then solve that issue with a targeted solution, you've got much more chance of being successful rather than going to one of the mega names and saying, can you help me with all of this, all of my financial crime problems? It's much clearer to say, I've got a, I've got a particular ID and V problem, or I've got an enhanced due diligence problem, or a KYC, and looking to the, the more nimble uh, solutions which can fix that and then connect back out with better data. So I do think historically, these programs that have run for three, five, seven years, very, very difficult to, to work out what success actually is because they often never end um, because the business is moving so fast that once you've fixed it, it needs fixing again. So it's very challenging. So well, that's what I liked about your presentation. You're reminding us it's more than just AML. It's more than just a bit of client stuff. It's uh, our clients exist in a whole range of scams and we have a, a role. Well, <laughs> we have a role in those scams. I'll, I'll leave you to <laughs> re-parse that. But, uh, and it's our job to make sure that that role is removed. Um, so, uh, so there. Um, got time for just two more questions, I think. Um, well, actually three, a uh, quick one. Hugh Purser wants to know, where, where does the name P2 come from? It's not too late to lodge the question. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my chairman, his name is uh, Pip Peel. So it's uh, P2 is the second iteration of his, uh, of his companies. Great. Uh, Andrew Churchill, aren't many of the trusted sources such as DVLA, uh, only ver verifying that they're holding accurate data on falsely obtained genuine credentials, merely confirming that it's organized crime rather than amateurs. Yeah, I think it is an ongoing challenge and those those uh, secure and trusted data sources need to keep improving. Companies House will be another one that's got an awful lot to do um, to, you know, get it back up to back up to scratch. Um, but there are elements of the, the you know, the, the central sources that can be relied upon and accessed. I think it's you don't want to, the, the new stuff now is actually, you don't want to give someone your whole driver's license, you just want them to confirm your date of birth so they can access a, the, the portion of your, of your secure record that's relevant to them only, rather than giving your name, date of birth, um, address, or whether you can drive a truck or not. You know, most companies don't need to know that, they're just trying to verify one particular data key point. So I think that, you know, secure access to specific data elements will, will come to the fore as well. Okay. And a final one, um, you titled your presentation, What Keeps a Financial uh, Crime Professionals Up Late at Night, but what, what would actually happen that would reverse the table? What, what would make it the case, in your opinion, that it would ought to be the financial criminals who are being cup, kept up awake at night? I, yeah, <laughs> to get quick. I think they probably are, um, but for different reasons. So if you're on the end of one of these phishing networks, then you're probably worried about your server farm staying up and running. So that you can hit another hundred thousand overnight you're probably sadly worried about whether the resources that you've coerced into working for you via various different means 
are going to stay alive long enough to press, you know, hit the keyboards for another eight hours. So I think they face different challenges and often challenges that we're probably glad that we don't face ourselves, to be honest. Okay. Well, it is really a fascinating subject and sadly we've run to time. So um, I, I really appreciate it and very kind of you to share all of this and re really raise the awareness and the alertness to, of, of all of us. And you've touched on so many other important issues like education and the, the continuance of it, but our role and responsibility in all this. So thank you. Um, but if I might, just three quick rounds of thanks. Uh, firstly, as ever to our sponsors, including, may I point out, uh, P2. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your generosity and allowing us to uh, intellectually wander, wander where we will. Um, I would like to thank the audience. You've been super today. Lots of good interaction. I think we got through most of your questions. Uh, this week, we have three days of employee share ownership. You're welcome to join. Uh, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And on Friday, we're going to be looking at artificial intelligence and the markets. But uh, as ever, check out the website. That's the, the ultimate authoritative aspect, if you can find our genuine uh, website itself. Uh, <laughs> but if you really want to find it with ultimate security, uh, may I recommend uh, Phil and his team. And Phil, thank you so much. I'm afraid in today's technology, doesn't really permit uh, tumultuous applause. Um, so I have my little uh, Korean karmic clapper here which we'll have to do as a sad substitute. Uh, but we thank, thank you. you so much for coming and we look forward to developments as uh, we fight this important menace, shall I say. Thanks, Michael. Cheers, guys. Good. Thanks for coming aboard. Cheers.